We've talked about climate mitigation, which is how can we actually work to stop climate change or reduce uh, uh, the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And we've talked about how climate change is affecting us uh, uh, now and how it's likely to affect us in the future. Climate adaptation really speaks to preparing for what the eventualities are uh, likely to be. And so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has defined adaptation for us. And uh, you can see the definition here is related to um, uh, responding to the actual or expected climatic stimuli uh, that we think uh, are going to happen and the ones that actually are happening. And uh, beyond that, to also look for opportunities to uh, respond in ways that are healthy and beneficial for humans. The Wisconsin Init Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, Wiki, uh, published a report in 2011 that um, had a, an entire chapter uh, dedicated to climate change adaptation. And so if we look at uh, that chapter, it can really be summarized into four main points. Uh, that an adaptation strategy for Wisconsin would include action, uh, that is that things that we do now to get ready, uh, building capacity, which is to say things we need to work on in order to get ready, and communication. Uh, communication really is uh, mostly focused on um, sort of matching expectations of citizens and agencies, uh, et, et cetera, so that uh, we're all sort of on the same page for what to expect. And then finally, filling gaps, which is a, a kind of a weird way of saying um, collecting and uh, collecting more data and monitoring data over time so that we can be responsive and adaptive uh, to the change as it happens. And so in the action realm, uh, this first category up here, there are several uh, items listed here, and I'm not going to walk through them, but I will say that they're largely related to uh, restoring ecosystem functions. And ecosystem functions are things like uh, the ability of uh, an ecosystem to intercept water as it falls as precipitation. So you can uh, the ability of an ecosystem to uh, slow down water as it infiltrates into an ecosystem. And these are largely functions that wetlands play, but it's also important to note that intact grasslands and forests also play an important role there. And so as we disturb soils and agriculture, as we uh, reduce vegetation cover, uh, we tend to speed up the runoff of water. And when that water is sped up, it tends to pull more nutrients out of the ecosystem, and those nutrients tend to end up in surface and groundwaters where we don't want them. And so uh, a, an important adaptation strategy is for us to restore ecosystem functions to slow down water and, and um, purify it or, or filter it. Included in this are a number of uh, focused um, um, efforts to um, provide regulatory controls on how many nutrients can leave agricultural systems, to provide regulatory controls on invasive species, which um, often impair ecosystem functions. The building capacity element of this is uh, largely about improving our models or our understanding uh, of how things actually work so that we can predict what's likely to happen. And the communication part of this is uh, largely around trying to map uh, our understanding and our predictions about what's likely to happen uh, to expectations that citizens have generally about uh, the way our ecosystems function. Finally, the last section here is about filling gaps, which is largely about collecting more data and monitoring systems over time so that we can manage them in an adaptive way so that we can be responsive as we see things change. Uh, next, I want to talk just briefly about um, results from the Wisconsin Integrated Cropping Systems Trial, WIX, which we've talked about in the past. And here I'm showing uh, the yields of six of our agricultural systems at WIXT over a 30-year period. So it's a nice long-term data set. Uh, what's really uh, neat about these data is that all six systems have been uh, standardized here so that the uh, y-axis is the same for all, and it's the amount of energy uh, coming off of each system, whether it's corn grain, whether it's biomass uh, in alfalfa, or whether it's uh, grassland, grass that's been consumed by a cow. Uh, we've done conver used conversion factors to put the yields on an apples-to-apples -apples basis so we can compare all six systems. <clears throat> Clearly, the annual-based systems, so that's the maize, the maize soybean system, those two systems are all annual plants all the time. And they also are the, the highest yielding 
And not only are the highest yielding, but they have the highest rate of increase in their yields over time. And that is largely reflecting the tremendous energy that's gone into breeding efforts and transformation efforts, plant modification efforts for those crops. And so every year, a new variety, uh, in most places, a new variety that's been developed gets planted. And those, those new varieties tend to be um, uh, higher yielding. And so we see this uh, uh, when there's this intensive uh, effort in, in breeding and, and plant modification, it really pays off in yields. That said, there is more uh, risk with those systems that in a particularly bad year, and you can see here in the corn that there were a couple of particularly bad years with respect to weather, that if the genetics of that annual crop aren't matched well for the weather pattern that year, that you can have a very uh, almost catastrophic uh, type of year in terms of yields. And so we might say that while there is the uh, higher chance that these are going to be uh, very, very productive, there's also a higher risk involved in that you might have a very, very bad year. And so inherently we say these, system, these systems are less stable over time. Uh, on the other hand, if we look over here at the systems that have alfalfa in them, whether they're managed organically, uh, and that's the, um, sorry, here are the systems with alfalfa down here, the uh, maize alfalfa 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 rotation, so maize with three years of alfalfa, you can see that there is an increase overall in yields, but it's not as variable. Uh, and so there's less risk associated uh, with those systems. Similarly, the organic systems, which have had even less uh, selection pressure through plant modification and breeding activities, are more variable over time and less, and their rate of increase in their yields is much lower. Finally, if we look at the managed pasture system, this is our only system that's perennial all the time. That is, uh, the alfalfa phase of these systems, those are perennial plants, but then we go back into corn, which is a, an annual plant. Here, we just have these pastures in place uh, year after year after year. And what's shown here is the above ground biomass in total. So we have some plots in these pastures where we uh, clip all of the biomass that's grow that grows above ground. And that, of course, is more than the amount of biomass that comes off when we simply harvest hay uh, three or four times a year. When we harvest hay, we leave behind a significant amount of residual biomass, the stubble of the plants, and so we don't get as much yield when we harvest hay as we do when we harvest the total amount of biomass. And of course, when you harvest the total amount of biomass year after year after year, you weaken those perennial plants and end up with lower yields over time. But these are experimental data here, these uh, purple uh, lines. And then finally, uh, here are yields that are calculated based on the average daily gain of the livestock in this system. And the livestock are grazing these grasslands. And you can see that uh, the yields there are low compared to what you get in hay and even what you get in these other systems. But there is less variation around that line. And so if you stare at these plots long enough, you see that uh, the more perennial the systems become, the more dominated they are by perennial plants. Uh, generally speaking, the lower yields there are, but the more stable the yields are. And so it becomes an easier system to manage, uh, largely because you have some reasonable expectation from one year to the next. You have some uh, ability to actually predict what you're going to get from one year to the next uh, in terms of productivity and yield. So there's a trade-off there. But uh, it is important to note that in the face of a change in climate, this ability to manage in the face of more erratic rainfall, uh, more intense rainfall, different temperature regimes, et cetera, that we've talked about in the past, it's going to become more and more important to be responsive like this. And it looks like perennial systems are likely to be less yielding overall, but uh, perhaps more resilient uh, in the face of erratic um, weather patterns. So just to summarize, uh, three big points, I think, to take away with respect to climate adaptation. First, we must act now, and we have to start to restore the ecosystem functions in, in our landscapes, whether that's restoring wetlands, uh, increasing perenniality of the landscape, etc. That's going to help us respond to increases in runoff, and it's going to help us reduce runoff, uh, which will help us uh, respond in ways that are beneficial. Uh, we have to continue to learn more about agricultural ecosystems. We have to continue to learn about how they respond, and then we have to find uh, um, effective ways to communicate uh, these uh, details to the public uh, so that we have um, enough public pressure to, to make good policy and that sort of thing. And then finally, uh, I think it, it's pretty clear that it behooves us to, uh, as farmers, manage for the optimum rather than the maximum.
And so this is related to that slide I showed you where if you're ex consistently expecting the maximum yield that you can squeeze out of an, eco an agro ecosystem every single year, there are going to be years where uh, you are seriously compromised with respect to the amount of investment you've made into your production system, et cetera. But if we are willing to accept uh, a little bit less or maybe significantly less in terms of yield, then expectations can be more stable uh, year after year after year. So that's an easy thing to say, uh, but certainly society and citizens at large have an important role to play in helping in, uh, incentivize this type of uh, mentality for farmers uh, and uh, consumers as well. So that's climate adaptation in a quick nutshell.